Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Um, so, hello, Christina. Hello. Um, there is a small change in schedule. Uh, we will start in um, uh, eight minutes. So nine oh, all right. time. All we, right, that's perfect. We have, been, we have been asked by the organizers. All right. I hope this is okay. No problem so. at all. <laughs> okay. So great. see you. See you.
Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, it is my huge honor to welcome you at this session. Thank you, Professor Zenkova and uh, the organizers. And we will start now uh, a very exciting session. Water structure, new insights and implications. I think this is a particularly exciting and important topic oriented towards the very core of aquaphotonics, the intricate nature of water itself. And let me introduce to you our first speaker, Christina Maria Tonauer, who is a PhD candidate in the research group of Professor Thomas Lerting at the Institute of Physical Chemistry, Leopold Franzens University in Innsbruck, Austria. During her master's uh, studies, she focused on synthesis, crystallization, and characterization of high density amorphous ice. Her thesis, Glassy Nuclei in Amorphous Ice, Novel Evidence for the Two Liquids Nature of Water, was awarded by Springer and appeared in the Springer Spectrum series Best Masters. Christina is a recipient of a DOC Fellowship of the Ocean Academy of Science, UAV. Her PhD project covers NIR spectroscopy and chemical reactivity in of crystalline and amorphous high pressure H2O ices. Please, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this really kind introduction. Today, I have the pleasure to talk about our recent publication on NIR spectroscopy of crystalline H2O ices. And first of all, I would like to give a little introduction on high pressure ice physics. Therefore, I would like to give you a little or show you the phase diagram of water. And first of all, I'm always overwhelmed by this huge number of crystalline phases that are uh, available for water. So the Roman numerals only tell us the order of discovery. So for example, ice two was the second polymorph that has been discovered and ice six is the sixth form. So unfortunately it doesn't really tell us much uh, information about the structure of the ice. To this day, we know 19 different crystalline phases. However, we expect to even discover many more in future. Why that is the case, I would like to talk a little bit about later. First, there's a question that is, um, where can we find these ices in nature? So on Earth, on the surface of Earth, as well as on the atmosphere, there is only hexagonal ice one that we can find. Can you see my pointer just for, uh, I guess? Yes, yes. All right, perfect. So on, on atmos on the in the atmosphere and on the surface, we only see hexagonal ice one, the common form of ice as we all know it. However, if we go a little deeper, and by a little, I mean actually 500 kilometers deep down to Earth's mantle, we can find I6 and I7 as inclusions in diamond uh, inclusions, so to say. So where can we find other forms of ice? Therefore, we would have to uh, go to a little more exotic places in the universe that are the icy moons of Jupiter or Saturn. For example, Ganymede, uh, jo Jovian moon, um, consists of different layers of uh, ice one, then ice three, ice five, and ice six, uh, depending on the depth of the layer. So um, fortunately, we in our lab in Innsbruck, we don't have to go to Ganymede. We can prepare these ices ourselves here and study them. So the second important question is, if we have a look at the phase diagram, is the question, why are there so many different crystalline forms of ice? And the answer to that question is that we can consider water in an ice crystal as a oxygen that has the ability to form four bonds, four hydrogen bonds, so to say, two times as a hydrogen donor and two times as a hydrogen acceptor, and thereby building an 
a huge amount of different topologies. So this becomes evident if we have a look at the structures that form. If we, for example, compress hexagonal ice. So let's start here at minus 100 degrees Celsius. We have the hexagonal ice structure. We know it all, the six membered rings and this rather open structure with channels. If we look down the C axis, but if we compress, hexagonal ice, the ice undergoes a density driven transition to ice two in order to minimize the free Gibbs energy. And ice two, how does the structure look like? It is still, it has still this hexagonal rings or the six membered rings. However, the hydrogen bonds here are already distorted. So uh, they are not perfectly linear anymore. And also the angles of uh, the water molecules are bent. And this yields this higher density of 1.117 grams per cubic centimeter. If we compress the ice even further to about one GPA, we're right in the middle of the stability range of ice six. And how does this structure look like? Um, so the six membered ring have vanished we have a much more packed uh, structure here. And if I use a little color, the main structural element here becomes more apparent. So I six consists of two sub lattices that interpenetrate, but do not interconnect or are not interconnected via hydrogen bonds. And therefore it is called a self clathrate structure. So what does that mean? A self clathrate or a cage structure in itself. If we have a look at, for example, one of, of this blue colored uh, oxygen atoms, um, one oxygen atom is coordinated by four adjacent uh, oxygen atoms via hydrogen bonds and forming a tetrahedron. Such a tetrahedron is connected to other tetrahedra here, as, as I show here, but it is directly uh, surrounded by tetrahedra of the other sub lattice. And therefore, it is at the same time uh, the gas molecule in such a cage, but also part of the cage for, for the gas molecule of another sub lattice. So, this is a really interesting structure or really. Um, amazing way how how uh, to show how water can deal with pressure. So what happens with the ice structure if we even increase the pressure more, increase it to about several hundreds of GPA? Uh, if we do that, we will see that atomic solid ice ten forms. So what is ice ten? How does the structure look like? Ice ten. In ice 10, the water molecule is not a water molecule anymore because uh, at these high pressures, there's hydrogen bond symmetrization happening. So that this means that the hydrogen cannot be assigned to any one of the oxygen atoms where it is in between. So um, this is also a very interesting structure. And there are even more um, ice structures uh, hypothesized that form upon higher pressures, even higher than that, that um, maybe have even metallic features. So I think um, if we have a look at these structures here, it is quite clear that oxygen can form a high number of different networks. However, there are also other um, phases that are not connected to the melt but are um, but form upon cooling of other crystalline phases and i show them here with the white arrows these are the so-called density uh, entropy sorry entropy driven transitions so in order to understand where this release of entropy or this ordering um, comes from Upon cooling, I should introduce the concept of hydrogen ordered and hydrogen disordered ice phases. 
And to do so, we should remind ourselves of the Bernal Fowler rules or the so called ice rules. They say that a, hydro, um, a water molecule in ice is similar geometrically uh, to a free H2O. So the bond lengths and the bond angles are similar than a, uh, to a H2O in the gas phase. Then the second rule says that the central water molecule is tetrahedrally coordinated by the adjacent H2Os forming hydrogen bonds. The third rule says there's only one hydrogen between two oxygens. And the fourth rule says any configuration satisfying the first three rules is equally probable. So in this sketch here on the left hand side, I, I sketched the six possible rotations of a central water molecule that are possible according to these rules. So um, here I, I, I drew, drew the dipole moments here, and I hope it's obvious that these six possible configurations um, can form. So what is a hydrogen disordered ice? In a hydrogen disordered ice phase, any of these six uh, rotations of a central of any uh, chosen uh, central water molecule are on average equally distributed whereas in a hydrogen ordered ice this is not the case so there are certain orientations that are favored more for example here i will want to show the example of ice 3 and ice 9 and we have to keep in mind both of these ices have the same oxygen network, but have but have a different hydrogen ordering. Ice three is hydrogen disordered, completely hydrogen disordered, whereas ice nine has two favored orientations. So the dipole moments, the, the orientations of the dipoles alter, uh, as I show it here, forming an anti-ferroelectric hydrogen ordered ice phase. So it's obvious that this ordering has a, a, high, a big impact on the electrical and also mechanical properties of the different ice phases, even though we keep it in mind, the oxygen sublet is, is the same. So here I, I wrote down values for the electrical permittivity. And in disordered ices, it is about or, or more than 100, whereas in ordered phases, the, um, the dielectric function is another word, uh, is close to one. So here, the, the white arrows now, as I showed them before, connects phases that share the same oxygen sub lattice, but are differently ordered, ice one, is disordered and upon cooling below 72 Kelvin, it orders to ice 11. However, it is not necessarily the case that there's only one ordered form, but there can be more than one ordered form corresponding to, to a disordered form. This fact has been shown very recently, actually by our group, so my colleagues Tobias Gasser and Alexander Töni together with Professor Lörting could show that there is a second ordered form related to ice 6 that is ice 19. And this um, was also shown by a Japanese group. So both of these uh, studies appeared in Nature Communications about one month ago. So very recent uh, results. So in this introduction, I hope I could show you that or why high pressure ices are such interesting materials. They show this wide range of different hydrogen bond topologies. So uh, open channels, hexagonal channels, nanotube-like structures, interpenetrating networks, uh, hydrogen bond symmetrization, empty clathrate structures, different ring sizes. So they're great systems to study Material for material scientific applications and also for fu fundamental research. So, in order to to probe the, 
the, the structural features of ISIS, usually there are two kinds of methods or two types of methods that are applied. Um, firstly, that is the fresh diffraction methods. So um, neutron diffraction or X-ray diffraction experiments. And also the second method is vibrational spectroscopy. However, if we look at the number of publications based on the different uh, methods, there's quite an imbalance. So there's a lot more diffraction studies than there are vibrational spectroscopy studies, um, which is somehow strange because both methods deliver different information on a system and should be considered complementary and should be done back to back. Because if we keep in mind what is uh, what is the demands that um, that diffraction studies meet, so they um, they uh, they offer data on the exact position of an atom in a unit cell averaged over a large number of unit cells. So they give um, information about space groups and so on. However, chemical bonds like hydrogen bonds or other bonds are actually invisible in diffraction studies. Um, to probe bonds or short ranged interactions, spectroscopy is the method of choice. So for example, by measuring um, decoupled spectra of um, hydrogen bonded systems by measuring the frequency shift of certain um, of certain bands, the, the bond lengths can be calculated very accurately, for example. So when we checked literature on MIR, NIR spectroscopy of high pressure ISIS, there is um, work done uh, for for ice one however if we look at the high pressure forms there is only a little bit done uh, in the mir region by bertie and co-workers uh, it was done in the 1960s however there are a lot ice phases that have been discovered uh, many years later so there's only a spectroscopic data on in the mir range until ice six and all the ices that were discovered later, there's not uh, there's no data in literature available. And even if and then if we look at the NIR range, um, it is even worse. There's no comprehensive study available on NIR spectroscopy of high pressure ices. So we decided, and by we, I mean our group, the group of Professor Lerting, together with the group of uh, Christian Hook, we de uh, decided that we should close this gap in ice physical chemistry. So we studied near infrared spectra of high density crystalline ices 2, 4, 5, uh, 6, 9, and 12. And as you can see, we could publish our result very recently in the Journal of Physical Chemistry A. And in this talk, I would like to highlight a few results from this study. So, but before I do that, I would like to talk a little bit about the experimental challenges um, that are present if we work with high pressure ices. So as I showed you before in the phase diagram, these ices form upon pressures higher than one GPA. Our press in our lab, where there is the sketch on the left hand side, uh, we can reach pressures up to two GPA or uh, 20,000 uh, bars. And we can perform temperature controlled or pressure controlled steps synthesi synthesizing these polymorphs that I showed you earlier. So these ices are stable at high pressure, but matter stable at ambient pressure if they are cooled to liquid nitrogen temperature. So whenever we prepare a high pressure form of ice, 
we quench recover it. That means we cool it to 77 Kelvin and decompress it and can recover it. But it is very important to always, whenever uh, we do further analysis or anything with this high pressure ice, that we keep it at 77 Kelvin or, uh, or else it will undergo undesired phase transitions. So here the picture on the right hand side shows you uh, a styrofoam box, which we usually um, use in order to handle or to prepare our samples. And the sample here is the silverly, silver shining uh, cylinder. Uh, this metal is actually indium that we use as a container material um, for our high pressure synthesis. So, the next step is the sample characterization. Therefore, we use um, powder X-ray diffraction. And the same applies for, for this measurement, as I said before. So we have to powder our sample in a styrofoam box with uh, the instruments that we use, the scalpel, the spoon, whatever. Um, cool to liquid nitrogen temperature. And as you can imagine, the transfer to the sample chamber is a really crucial, crucial step. And the sample must not be warm up, warmed up at this point. So we measure these samples at um, uh, low temperatures, so 17 Kelvin with our helium cryostat. And there we get the, the, the structure the powder, from the powder X-rays. And now the final step in our study, or the most interesting one, are the NIR measurements of the high pressure ices. Therefore, we used the Büchi Nearflex N500 FT NIR spectrometer in the hook lab. And we, we measured in diffuse reflectance mode. This mode has this has a big advantage that we can fill our cuvettes with powdered ice. So due to gravity, the powder will sink to, to the window. And on top, we can still fill the cuvette with liquid nitrogen. So the ice is cooled to 77 Kelvin during the whole measurement. So uh, we fill a cuvette, put it in the optical path of the spectrometer, and um, we conducted measurements that lasted about 16 seconds, collecting enough spectral data. Um, and before the, before the ice warmed up. So at all times of this uh, experiment, the, the ice sample was cooled to liquid nitrogen temperature. And this is uh, the main challenge, or this is the big advantage of this method here. And probably also a reason why it took so long until high pressure ices were characterized in the NIR region. So here, just a little, um, just a slide about how we then evaluated the NIR spectra. It's of course very short here shown. So we calculated, uh, we measured in diffuse reflectance modes, as I already mentioned, we converted these spectra to kubel kamank function spectra and performed a baseline correction and normalized the spectra, normalized it to one characteristic band for each polymorph. Here it is shown for ICE-1, which we used as a reference because there's already spectral data available in literature. So, and after we normalized the spectra, we summed them up and we got one spectrum for each polymorph consisting of several hundred of single scans. So with these sum spectra, we then try to identify features of, uh, of the, uh, in the NIR region. So here are two, here's an example of I6 and I12. So the upper, upper spectrum is the one of I6. 
And here in gray, I show the spectrum in the MIR range that was available in literature uh, measured by Bertie et al. And according to their uh, spectral assignment, we also worked or we also found our assignment. So the most important features as we figured out for uh, analysis are the first overtone of the new OH uh, stretching vibration as, uh, at around uh, 6,500 and the combinational band at around 500 wave numbers, which is the combination band of the stretching vibration new OH plus bending vibration and the stretching vibration plus the first overtone of the libration. And so these features are quite similar for all of the high pressure ices. They can also be found in hexagonal ice. However, there are frequency shifts present. And in, in the next slide, I would like to uh, show you one uh, analysis we performed. So we had a here at the panel A, on the left-hand side, we uh, compare the different high pressure ices. And what is, which is really obvious is this feature for hexagonal ice that is at about 6,050 wave numbers. And this feature undergoes a blue shift in the high pressure ice forms. So we figured uh -huh. maybe this is a good indication for density, this band and the related band shift for each um, high pressure form. So what we did was we plotted this blue shift against density here in panel C. And as you can see, there's a quite nice um, correlation with density. However, there are two outliers, which are ice 12 and ice four. And we were not really satisfied with, um, with the interpretation that these are just outliers. So we were looking for another interpretation. And therefore, the study, the theoretical study of Herrero and Ramirez really helped us. They did a study on topological characterization of crystalline ice structures. And what they did, it what they defined um, topological density. So what is a topological density? It is basically the question with how many um, water molecules is a central molecules collect, uh, connected in the first, in the second, in the third, or in the four, 40th coordination, coordination shell. And as we can see here in the graph at figure one, uh, at low coordination shell numbers, this is very similar for, uh, for every ice polymorph. Of course, if we think about the first coordination shell, um, it's the same for every ice because a central water molecule is connected with four other water molecules via the hydrogen bonds. However, this coordination number changes with um, increasing topological density and topolo uh, uh, topological distance, sorry. Topological distance is defined by number of hydrogen bonds. And in this graph, we can see that, for example, ice 12 is very dense. So the slope of this parabola uh, increases faster than the slope of I6. But if we think back, um, I showed you the structure of I6. It is the structure with the interpenetrating uh, networks. It, it becomes obvious that I6 is not connected to as many um, other water molecules because um, since these um, subnetworks are not connected with each other. So by, uh, by calculating the slope of these parabolas, they, for, they, they could calculate a, pa a parameter R and calculate of, out of this parameter an expression for topological density. And um, this is actually what we then plotted against this blue shift of this band here in um, panel C. And you can see, this is a very nice 
uh, correlation that we can see here. I would like to highlight this result because I think it is very significant since this concept of topological density was introduced by theoreticians. However, until now, there was not really an experimental way to probe it. However, now we found a way to probe this um, using NIR spectroscopy. So fortunately, the Journal of Physical Chemistry A agreed with us that these results are quite significant and they featured our article on the cover of their February issue. And I think, or I hope at least, um, it conveys that NIR of uh, or it, that it conveys how cool an IR spectroscopy of high pressure ices really is. So what do we want to do next? I would like to give you a little outlook. So we really <laughs> look out into space. So uh, next we want to study ices that are more that are even more exotic than the ones we studied. So ices that only occur in space, however, at the very high abundance. And these are the amorphous ices of water. So we would like to study them in our lab using an IR spectroscopy. And this is actually there. It's a really good opportunity that the James Webb Space Telescope, the biggest infrared uh, covering spec um, telescope ever built, um, is going to be launched in October of this year. So we are looking forward to the data um, that the telescope will collect, data of um, interstellar dust or icy moons. So we hope that we can give a cont contribution to infrared astronomy. So all that is left to say for me now is a big thank you. Thank you to Thomas Lörting, Christian Huck, and all the other co-authors, as well as the funding agencies. And of course, thank you, dear ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Christina, for extremely exciting talk. Um, we have uh, time for questions. Uh, anyone interested um, in asking question from the audience? Okay, um, I would like to ask about two things uh, a bit related to each other. Mm -hmm. um, uh, firstly, uh, what are the locations in the universe uh, where this very high density ice uh, uh, can form? This is one thing and the other thing, okay, maybe you could please answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, as I mentioned before, there's, there are icy moons um, around um, Jupiter and uh, Saturn. And of course, on the surface, um, um, we expect the low density force. However, these moons have also tectonics. So we, ex um, we expect that the high pressure forms from uh, deeper layers would come up to the surface um, by tectonics, which is also how the inclusions, the diamond inclusions of I6 and I7 were found on Earth. So due to uh, tectonics, but also um, impacts of um, ionizing um, beams, so ionizing um, radiation could also be a possibility how to form these high pressure ices. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question is related to the other, um, let's say boundary, this, um, uh, ISIS uh, with minimal entropy, what would be the mechanism uh, of this minimization of, of entropy for them? Yeah, this is a really good question. There ha have been a lot of uh, studies. So tunneling might be an uh, important effect here because um, the ordering um, is uh, prohibited in most cases uh, if we do these experiments with D2O, so with uh, deuterized um, H2O. However, how, how we over overcome this problem is that we um, introduce um, dopants into the ice lattice, so HCl or KOH, 
So we have actual, um, we have um, defects. So there's, there may be sometimes there's no hydrogen between two oxygens or two hydrogens. And these defects, they um, um, increase the kinetics of such an ice. So that we can even um, form hydrogen ordered forms in deuterized samples. But to your question, tunneling is certainly uh, a big effect here. And this, this sounds really interesting. Um, okay, um, any any questions from? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I can, can I have a, a, a comment and, and question? Yes, sure. Yeah, thank you very much for, uh, it's very fascinating. And, and when I read your paper, and when I saw the, the spectral eyes, um, the real, um, it is so similar to the spectrum of the water. <laughs> so, um, to make it closer to aquaphotonics. Um, I, I was thinking um, your experiment, as you described it, uh, you, you use liquid nitrogen to keep the low temperature, but mm -hmm. it is not possible forever, right? So have you thought about monitoring this ice over different temperatures? Yes, exactly. This is our ongoing work right now. So uh, my recent experiments are on heating of different um, ices and how the bands change. And yeah, exactly. Beautiful, because I was thinking um, you are, um, your goal is uh, going to the space. And I think um, we've published a paper on approving the fractality of water which means that whatever we see in a micro world, in a, so it, it will be in the macro as well. So whatever we see, we should be able to see it in the space as well. So um, by doing this, by having accumulating data, spectral data at different temperatures, starting from eyes, then you can go through all possibility of um, uh, water structures described by the spectral pattern. And mm -hmm. then when you go to the space, then you could identify and recognize what kind of, of uh, structure you, you actually have. And aquaphotomics, what we are doing, we try to connect functionality of those structures. So we go through different, various kinds of systems and we find consistency for each uh, specific water structure or combination. So we call this structure on the specific band a letter. So when mm -hmm. you combine few letters, then you get a word and that word describes the function. So you might be able to go to space and, and see what the water is doing there. It is, it's really fascinating. So I, I yes. wish you a very good luck with your research. Thank um, you very much. May I have one, one short comment and one short question, Chris? Of course. Possible? So yes, regarding... Please. Uh, thank you. So regarding the um, um, your um, voyage to space, I um, if you have anything arranged, that, that would be fantastic, but I would really like to have near infrared somewhere in space, like on the surface of Mars, uh, Moon, and so on. So uh, in regard to that, I may, uh, by some uh, very, very um, strange coincidence, I happen to know uh, a person who is a director of the Radar system engineer and technical group supervisor of this Mars space mission. So uh, she, she might be able to help with, um, uh, let's say, launching uh, the device, if possible. Maybe, I don't know, one day. I hope so. So um, that's that's my comment. I, I really would love to see that. Uh, the questions that, that, that I have is, about the nature of interaction of these uh, different types of ice structure with the different type of light, meaning um, the light like uh, laser light and um, you, the, um, basically like um, source, uh, we, sources we use usually for spectroscopic measurements. Because of, uh, uh, to, tomorrow, very interesting talk will be uh, performed by 
uh, Craig Schwartz from um, United States, from the laboratory of Professor uh, Richard Cycli. And they have very interesting question on whether um, the water is a continuous um, um, mo model or a two-phase model because they have uh, conflicting measurements using different basic light sources. So mm. I would like to know. So uh, on the different uh, spectral region, you mean? What, what, what is it? Wait, or on the different light sources? Uh, coherent versus okay. non-coherent non light and the interaction with uh, these ice structures. Mm. There, I think there's not really <laughs> much work done on that uh -huh. uh, on that question, since uh, as I showed before, there there's in the NIR range or also in the UV range uh, where we expect uh, a shift of this uh, absorption edge. So there's really not much data and also not much data or uh, so not known to me data on different interactions based on the light source. So. Um, I don't think that there's anything in literature on that. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, unfortunately the time is over, uh, but I can see uh, some questions in chat. Maybe uh, the discussion okay. could somehow follow in the chat. Um, thank you, Christina, for extremely exciting talk. And now uh, let me introduce to you our next speaker, uh, Dr. Justyna Grabska who obtained her doctorate uh, in physical and theoretical chemistry from the University of Wrocław in Poland. Her thesis uh, focused on developing new methods of analysis of vibrational spectra and physical chemistry. 